Uh, so in celebration of International Day of Women and Girls in Science, which was February 11th, uh, we welcome you to our first All in Tech Upskill webinar se series of 2022. Um, although there has been great progress, women remain underrepresented in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics disciplines around the world. Here at All in Tech, our vision is to create 10,000 tech opportunities for women and people of color in the workplace by 2030. Thank you for joining us today. So without further ado, I would like to present to you Decolonizing Science with Dr. Chandrima Gangbi. Uh, Chandrima is a junior research fellow at the University of Cambridge at the Department of Applied Mathematics and Theoretical Physics. Uh, Chandrima is a cosmo uh, cosmologist testing early universe models and is interested in using machine learning and AI to constrain particle physics and theories of gravity. She's also passionate about gender uh, justice advocacy and is involved in various projects and initiatives. Uh, Chandri was particularly interested in the Just AI project and the intersection uh, between right, gender rights and technology. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping rules before I hand it over. Uh, can you please keep your mics on mute and videos off for bandwidth purposes? We will have a 20 minute Q&A session at the end. So please feel free to share your questions in the chat box as we go, uh, or you can also unmute your mic after the presentation. Uh, now we'll be handing it over to you. Thank you so much for that introduction. I'm just going to uh, start sharing my screen. So bear with me for one moment. Sorry. Right. I think we're good. One more moment. Well, thank you so much for coming to my talk. And thank you so much to Haya and Varuni and All in Tech for giving me the opportunity to talk about this topic, which is um, very, very close to my heart. The first question I'm going to ask um, by kicking off this talk is the question of whether science is objectively true. Now, I encourage you to keep this, uh, the answers that you may come up with, um, with yourselves at the moment, and it'd be interesting to see if the answers change as we go through the talk. The next question I'm going to ask, I'm actually going to ask you to vote on this one, is do you think planes fly? Now, I understand that this is a bit of a cop-out because I'm showing you a picture of a plane actually flying, but um, if you want, you can scan a QR code um, on the QR code given, given on the screen and actually vote for whether you think uh, planes fly. And I'll give you a couple of seconds to do that. Cool. So most of you think planes fly. Those of you who do not think planes fly, I guess COVID has been all right because I've been having like really bad um, not lack of travel anxiety. But in answer to that question, planes fly most of the time. In fact, planes fly. The 2021 was seen to be one of the safest years um, for air travel and large aircrafts, uh, for large aircrafts, but one in about 50 million crashed. So you'd be betting pretty safely on the assumption that planes did in fact successfully fly. And this is a really simple, if a bit of a, a pointless experiment in trying to show you that science can be objectively true, or at least within uh, the bounds of statistical error, in saying uh, things about situations that are simple, such as this, where you know, the, uh, the parameters of the situation are quite constrained, and we can quantify our error or our uncertainty in the scientific result about whether planes can fly. The next question I'm going to ask you is to do with my current field of study, which is cosmology. And the question is, how did the universe begin? As you, the universe right now of what we know of it um, is about 14 billion years old. And so to answer this question, we take uh, observational evidence from the universe as we observe it today. And then we try to reconstruct the history of the universe. This process is quite complicated and it's really hard to agree upon a answer to this question. One of the answers is that the universe began through a big bang. And another answer that I've studied quite a lot is the big bounce alternative where the universe went through a period of contraction, a, period, a minima, and then re-expanded into our current uh, phase of expansion of the universe. Uh, 
And some say that it's actually impossible to test the difference between these two models because they're not models at all, but they're actually paradigms or ways of thinking. So the answer that the universe began with the Big Bang, though scientific, is not an objective answer. So when I ask you whether science is objective, I expect the answer to be, well, it depends on the context in which we're using the scientific method and how applicable it is. So because science is intensely, and I believe, as you will see in the course of this talk, that it is an intensely sociopolitical and a cultural effort, it does influence so society, culture, and politics to, see, to talk about how we see science. And so actually, as scientists, I would call for action to the scientific community to be a bit more transparent about the science that we're doing and its possible limitations. And the call to action for everybody else who do not consider themselves to be directly a part of the scientific community would be to investigate scientific claims and the underlying models before accepting it as a fact. And I know this is an extremely tall order, but I consider this to be essential, particularly as we have seen in the course of this pandemic or with climate change, and how politicized science can become. In fact, as I will argue later on, science is political, but it does not mean that it can be influenced, that it can be manipulated for political influence without the awareness of the community that consumes science. So if we don't know what objective science is, and I would argue that most people uh, categorize objective truth and objectively good science as good science, then it's very hard for us to tell who is a good scientist. And so if we take a moment to think about the practitioners of this good science, then something very interesting comes up. So this picture is actually something that came up on Google when I Googled good scientist. And I think this points to the problem, right? When we think about who is a good scientist, we usually come up with somebody who looks like the person on the picture. But not to say that this person is not a good scientist. All I'm arguing is our metrics for deciding who is a good or bad scientist is inherently flawed because we don't really have metrics of figuring out what is an objectively good scientific claim. I would say on days when my self-confidence is do doing well, that this is a picture of a really good scientist. And unfortunately, um, most of the scientific establishment, the way it has been structured, would, be, would tend to disagree with me. The problem is encapsulated um, in the context of my field um, in this blog post by a cosmologist whom I really like, and they write, Chandra Prescott Weinstein, they write about the problem of toxic masculine cosmology. Now they were writing in the context of a particular um, scientific discovery, uh, which was to do with the detection of a cosmologically produced gravitational waves. The story was a total debacle. There were a team of scientists who rushed uh, to verify this uh, Big Bang theory that I was talking about earlier and were not careful with um, uh, trying to understand the observations that they had collected and were not collaborative with another team in figuring out what the, how, how to cl clean the model data that they had. And what ended up happening was that they, they published erroneous results and made very large claims in the media, which were not in keeping with the science that they were trying to put forward. Now this incident uh, puts forward some things which I think are wrong with the culture in which I do science in my community of cosmologists and the way in general we do science. It seems that it is more important to compete and to get to the answer first than to do this in a spirit of collaboration and trying to get the best answer. There is more of an emphasis on getting the right answer than the best possible. And this is a problem, as we just discussed, that there is no right answer. We can have a best possible, an optimized answer. And I would argue that the most important thing in, in getting to that optimized answer is to do this in a spirit of collaboration and community, instead of trying to be the first one or the best one, because there is no best in an objective sense. This culture problem, along with other socioeconomic factors, lead us to statistics like the one I've just put up on the screen. This is a statistic of the number of African-American and Hispanic women with astronomy bachelor's degrees. It's slightly outdated, but I wouldn't say that the problem is much different now. 
The number of Hispanic women are low, but the number of African-American women are shockingly low. Now, there are many socioeconomic factors and issues of access uh, around marginalized communities to point to why this is the case. But another reason why I do believe that this turns out the way it is, is because of the culture in which we practice science and the way we as a society see science. We see science as a monolith that cannot be wrong. And during the COVID pandemic, I was quite um, confused and concerned to see it being re 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 referred to as a monolith by non-scientists and, and political powers. So what I'm really asking for is climate change. And no, I'm not advocating for um, increased greenhouse gas emissions. In fact, the attitudes around science right now, I would argue is partially responsible for the unsustainable way that we have done, we have used science and technology to lead us to the current problem, uh, the climate change that we are facing. What I'm really asking for is a change in the way we see merit in science. And, and with that, that could be reflected in the change in the way we distribute power within scientific establishments. As a part of the academic scientific community, I have found that the way power and privilege is distributed uh, in the community is to be extremely hierarchical. And often the people who occupy positions of power do so for very little cause other than a chance of birth. I would also argue that a way that we can truly create an inclusive and equitable environment in which we do science is by changing hiring practices and recruitment practices. Perhaps we shouldn't just recruit based on a number of papers or the amount of grades or things that point to an imagined idea of an objective meritocracy, but instead we should hire and, and put an emphasis on people who have community values, who are committed to creating um, a community in which science is done. I do think that we will end up doing better science more honest science if we are able to do this. So this brings me to the title of my talk, the concept of decolonizing. Now there are, very, there are many definitions of decolonizing and I have just chosen one. And this one is done by the Decolonizing SOAS Working Group. And they say that decolonizing is the effort to interrogate and transform the institutional, structural, and epistemological legacies of colonialism. Now, this is interesting because this came out of a movement that I will discuss in a little bit more detail called Decolonizing the Curriculum, which started in South Africa. And the idea is that how do we change the way we view knowledge and the way we consume knowledge and the way we use knowledge and break away from imperialistic and colonial um, origins of the way this is structured currently. So the way I view that we can do this is through a twofold process. We start with the idea of decolonizing the mind or the individual, and then we decolonize community practices. Individuals who change the way they practice science, if we acknowledge the humanity of the scientific practitioner, if we understand the sociopolitical and cultural context in which this science is done, then this individual will have an impact upon the community in which they reside. And if we change community practices about how we do science, how we hire, how we distribute power, how we see science as an endeavor, and how, and if perhaps we could see this as a community endeavor and acknowledge the history of the scientific establishments and truths that we hold dear now, then perhaps that could also create an impact upon the individual person who exists in this community. So with a view of the first part, with acknowledging the sociopolitical and cultural context in which science is done and the science that we do now and its history, I'm gonna give you a few examples. So one of the examples that um, I thought of was quite um, close to me. Um, I'm from Kolkata. Um, it's a city in West Bengal in India. And because we are, um, we are a tropical country, we have a problem with malaria. Not a lot, but the disease exists. And we have very good treatments for this now. And that is largely due to the fact that a scientist called Ronald Ross managed to um, identify the malarial parasite in his labs in Calcutta, now Kolkata. But the way he identified it and ultimately won a Nobel Prize for his work was through experiments that were done on brown bodies, on the bodies of my people. And they were not given the humanity that they should have been as human beings 
but they were, they were treated as experimental samples. They were dehumanized and exploited for the purpose of his scientific discovery. He made no secret of his views on the matter when he addressed the British parliament and said, in the coming century, the success of imperialism will depend largely upon the successes with the microscope. And then you begin to see why a lot of anthropologists sometimes equate or synonymize the ideas of modernism and progress in science with imperialism and with colonialism. Medi medicinalization of bodies for the purpose of scientific progress has, has often and has repeatedly been a mainstay of imperialistic scientific endeavors. Let me take you on a bit of a thought experiment, which I thought was really interesting. Um, one of the fields of study that I practice is the field of quantum mechanics and quantum field theory. Now, quantum mechanics is exciting because it's ubiquitous. The smartphones you use, um, electronics in every form is completely based upon quantum mechanics. Another reason why it's interesting to me was because um, the discovery or the, the understanding of quantum mechanics in the 20th century uh, brought along a paradigm shift in the way uh, scientists viewed the world. So one of the mainstays of quantum mechanical philosophy is the wave particle duality where um, the entity of a particle on a wave is not seen to be absolute, but it changes based on, sometimes based on the observer. This, this goes into the idea of quantum measurement, which then says, says that the act of observation will change the object or the body that, or system that is being observed. Now, this was revolutionary at the time because until then, um, most scientists had been realists and thought that regardless of whether you observe something, the entity or the body or system would remain the same. But this idea of anti-arab realism, also another thing that happened in quantum mechanics was that uh, the idea that all parts of a radiation spectrum, so for example, radiation that you would get out through atomic transitions um, in, in an atom, that radiation would be discrete. So you could not access all parts of the spectrum. You would only get radiation such as light, such as any sort of other uh, parts of the visible and invisible spectrum. You would get that in discrete packets. This was also different from the classical understanding of radiation. So as I said, before this, um, scientists were realists. Scientists believed that the, the essentialism of objects would remain unchanged. Scientists believed that all parts of the spectrum could feasibly be accessed. I'm gonna compare this to the difference in the way music and musical traditions have evolved in the West and what we consider Eastern musical traditions. In the Western musical traditions, you have discrete notes, you have tones and semitones, and people don't, don't, I should say they are classical musical traditions, and people don't really think about the frequencies of sound that fall between the tone and the semitone. Whereas in Eastern musical traditions, for example, in Indian classical music, or actually even in the West in jazz, which actually came from um, Eastern musical traditions, the frequencies between a tone and a semitone are easily accessed. And the idea of music is not so rigid. So I would like to think that given the fact that the anti-realist, more flexible understanding of the world was a social mainstay um, in non-Western, non-Eurocentric cultures, would we have had to wait till the 20th century to have discovered quantum mechanics if the scientific establishment had grown in a different culture, if there had been funding for science, scientific progress in a different context, in a different cultural context, and in a society with a different cultural outlook. The truth is we will never know, but it's interesting to think about that the history of science as it has developed has been informed by a predominant cultural view, and that has influenced the way science has grown and developed. So everything that I'm talking about um, has entered into uh, the mainstream because of two movements. The first movement was in the University of Cape Town in 2015 called Roads Must Fall, where they asked for the decolonization of, of thought, of knowledge and of the curriculum. They were asking for uh, a change in the way knowledge was viewed and a change in the way knowledge was, was legitimized, excuse me. 
This led to uh, the, the Science Must Fall movement, uh, which was an offshoot of this movement, where they questioned what counted as scientific, scientific knowledge and who got to decide. And this interrogation leads us to the conclusions that I have somewhat touched upon, that the person, the people who decide whether scientific knowledge is colonial, if scientific knowledge is legitimate or not, is, is empowered to do so by a colonial and imperial history. With this, I'm going to go to a, a community-based, a practice-based case study. And this case study um, relies on, a, um, on, on AI. I'm aware that this is an all in tech uh, seminar. So I thought it would be interesting to talk about the ideas around decolonizing technology as well. Now, whether or not um, you think that, uh, whether or not you're very aware of artificial intelligence and machine learning, it is it has become a part of modern life. And, because it has become so ubiquitous, um, concerns about whether artificial intelligence models, machine learning models are safe for use in society and what kind of societal impacts they might have, have been raised. One such concern has been raised uh, in this seminal study called Gender Shades by Dr. Joy Bolamwini and Dimnit Gebru. And they study facial recognition systems which are commercially used and also used in law enforcement. And they have shown in this study that actually these facial recognition systems are biased against gender and are biased against race because they happen to be about 80% um, accurate for light skin male presenting faces, but less than 31% less accurate for dark skinned uh, female presenting faces. But this is quite concerning given that these facial recognition systems are widely used in society are also used to surveil uh, diaspora populations. This is an example, a very practical example of how these AI systems could be biased. And the authors point towards many reasons for this. For example, the way algorithms are structured, but also in the way data is collected and labeled and who does the collection and from which populations this data is being mined. Another paper that I will point to is a re review article about decolonial thought in artificial intelligence written by Shakir Mohammed and collaborators. And they talk about de decolonial theory and how it could be applied to an artificial intelligence model and pipeline. And they discuss um, how we could actually improve our practice of machine learning and computation to empower communities that are marginalized through so social forces and also through the use of these algorithms. So with this example, I would like to try to give you a practical idea of what a decolonizing framework could look like in the context of AI. What does it mean to decolonize community practices and how can we actually do better? So something that I have been working on with my friend and collaborator, Idil Hassan, is the idea of purposeful and community-based labeling. We have been trying to come up with a decolonial AI framework and we are working on the first step where we try to interrogate the data collection phase of the, the, the life, life cycle of a machine learning model. And ultimately, and I will discuss this in more detail, we are advocating for a participatory research-based um, endeavor in, co in collecting data. Before we uh, try to talk about the solution, um, I'd just like to discuss a little bit about how data is collected and labeled right now. It could be in through several ways. You could have synthetic data, which is created by a computer code. You could have some open source databases, which are labeled by, honestly, no one really knows, but freelance workers or who are not paid very much or workers in very extreme cases, some companies have been shown to use prison labor. Um, data is also collected by commercial organizations in, in exchange for um, internet users using their services. And we will discuss the conditions of this as well. Some problems with this obviously are that data being collected by commercial organizations in exchange for internet services is, is collected without meaningful consent on the side of the internet users. Um, on, in theory, when you click the I consent button, you are consenting, but it is only meaningful if you are made aware of the endpoint 
of the model in which your data is going to be used or of the model at all. And it is only meaningful if you have an option to access the similar service to participate in modern life if you did not consent to this use of your data. Open source databases are being labeled by freelance workers who are extremely badly paid in most cases and have very unstable contract. And they are not aware about the endpoint of the data they're labeling and how they're going to be used. And synthetic data, of course, is being generated by computers. So what we're calling for is a more purpose-driven and community-driven approach to this process. The first tenet of this idea is, of course, transparency. Uh, companies who use commercial models or who deploy commercial models have to be transparent about the endpoint of the models that they are going to use the data for. In the machine learning community, generalizing a model for various situations is known to be quite a bad thing to do. And in fact, this is actively discouraged. In the same spirit, I would advocate that generalizing data for various model training purposes is also a flawed assumption to make. I'll give you a very simple thought experiment for this. If data is collected in a Western city, let's say London, um, on, from a community on the base of race and ethnicity markers and say pronouns, and the same kind of categorization data labels are applied to data being collected in my, my home city of Kolkata, this would make very little sense. Pronouns as a marker of gender identity is something that is done in English and other Western European languages. In Bengali, we don't have pronouns in the same way. And of course we do still suffer from gender binaries, but asking people for pronouns as a marker of their gender does not make sense. Also asking people for their racial and ethnic identities makes less sense than asking for, for example, their religious, their religious identifications or their caste identifications. As you can see, even data labels have to be culturally contextualized, have to be socially grounded. The next thing um, comes down to the meaningful consent of the users. Users whose data is being used to generate these uh, large scale machine learning models have to be able to meaningfully consent, not just from the context of privacy, but also in the context that they should know what their data is being used for and why before they can consent to their data being mined or used at all. Finally, the people doing the labeling of, the, of, the, of this data have to be informed about why this labeling activity is occurring because that could change the way that they label the data. What we are advocating for then is not just purposeful labeling, but also labeling that occurs within a community. So we are saying that a participatory research framework where knowledge as mine, as extracted from data is, is, can be legitimate if this knowledge comes from within the community around whom this data is concerned. This would lead to a few things. So first of all, as we said, AI models would not, would not, are not generalizable, but we don't assume that data itself will be generalizable. We are specific, we are model specific about the labels and the categories in which this data is put. Participant communities would, could take ownership of the process of data collection and actually have transparency and some control about the way their data is being used and know for what purpose they are labeling and, and mining their data. If we have community-based labelers, then it can be assumed that by having ownership, they also have the interest of their own communities at heart. And the way they label this data cannot be to harm this community because they will have some degree of accountability to them. If then we set up a system where these community-based laborers will be paid a fair wage, then they could also in turn transmit this way to the individual labelers who would no longer be on uncertain unpaid or underpaid contracts. And commercial organizations who utilize this data would have to pledge an idea of transparency, accountability, as well as paying fair wage. So this is just the first step of what a purposeful and community-based labeling exercise could look like. An example of this being actually put in practice that I have found, I'm sure there are others, is Data for Black Lives. Now, Data for Black Lives gained prominence after the murder of George Floyd by the law enforcement officer Wayne Cousins in Minneapolis. 
in 2020. And this initiative looks to collect data that highlights the issues that are facing uh, Black and African American people. So for example, um, and this is particularly uh, important because the data that is being mined at the moment has largely been shown to racialize and marginalize uh, this community. So one of the things that they have done is that they have collected a lot of COVID-19 data to show how the pandemic has affected Black and African American people. This data is collected specifically for this purpose, to safeguard Black lives. They also have an open call to their community in asking for any issues or concerns that they have that they can that they would then collect data to amplify those issues and concerns. So as they say on their web page, they view data as protest, they view data as accountability, and they view data as collective action. This is the first step of, as I said, of the machine learning model pipeline. There are other steps, and I will not go into too much detail. The next step is one that I call algorithmic fairness, which is actually designing the algorithm. One way of doing this could be through explainable uh, AI practices, where certain AI models, such as deep learning models, um, which are very useful, but are very much of a black box. So we don't really know the, the real reasons for the relationships between input and output. But if you think about the fact that the input and output could actually be related to people and people's lives, deploying them large scale without really understanding the relationship becomes quite dangerous. So there is a call and a push for many actually commercial organizations to have more explainable models. There's another uh, school of thought which looks at understanding bias in the algorithm itself. And one way that has been suggested in the paper I've linked there is by using something called counterfactual uh, AI, where people try to understand what the effect of categorization as an exercise, instead of looking at the individual category, categories such as race and ethnicity or gender identity has on outputs. So it uses mathematical um, uh, theories from counterfactual sets to try to construct arbitrary categories to study what the outcome would be on a, on a target outcome. For example, the one they have studied is uh, whether somebody gets rejected or accepted for a job. And finally, in the last step, um, more fairness practices need to be um, introduced into testing these models and this testing has to occur on users who can meaningfully consent to having these models tested and who need to be fairly remunerated for their practice. And they need to have complete transparency about why, these why they are doing this testing ex exercise and what this model is being deployed for. And finally, some accountability after the model has been deployed by commercial organizations, I think, is needed. But this, I've gone very quickly through um, what I would consider a decolonial uh, machine learning uh, pipeline. And I think I come to the end of my talk. And with this, I would be happy to take questions. Great, thank you for this. Um, definitely, I used to take it for granted that anything scientific or based on data is objective. <laughs> This will definitely get me curious thinking about how the data was collected, uh, the methodology used. Uh, so yeah, thank you for this. Um, if anyone has a question, you can unmute the mic or share it in the chat box. I guess it, I have a question in the meantime until uh, everyone, uh, until people start asking um, about the biases uh, with AI and data. Um, if you can just explain a bit more, um, I'm particularly interested in it in the job applications, uh, how a lot of the systems have become uh, based on algorithms. You submit your application, it gets filtered uh, through the system. Um, what are the, so if we can just, touch upon that a bit more, um, the consequences, I believe that increases the gender gap, uh, especially from what I understood, they take the top candidates, use those characteristics and then put them into the system. Um, so yeah, what are your thoughts? Uh, so, regarding that? I mean, you demonstrated a, a, a problem with this immediately, right? When you said they take the top candidates. So this is what I mean by the fact that databases on which these algorithms are trained 
are themselves biased. And this very similar thing happened with the facial recognition thing that I was talking about because they were training on just, you know, white male faces. And a similar thing happens with this. So that's one, one part of the step where the databases on which um, these algorithms are trained are biased towards um, the, the socially so far dominant um, uh, group. So if the databases are, are keep perpetuating the racial and gender disparities that we see in society today, and then these algorithms are being trained on these databases, then these algorithms will also perpetuate these racial and gender stereotypes. But it gets deeper than that, because if you think about um, the way you train an algorithm is that you show them um, some input and say you go with the input characteristics, you say gender, race or ethnicity, income group or something. And then you say the output is hired and not hired, right? And you've categorized your data based upon these three categories. And what this paper is actually is saying is that these categories are invented by someone. They are not unbiased. The choice to categorize people based on these categories is not, is not objective. Somebody made that choice. What would happen if we didn't categorize them based on these categories? What would happen if we categorize them based on something, I don't know, silly, like how thick are your eyebrows or something, you know? And so this paper, this, uh, this method, counterfactual AI, is looking into counterfactual logic from set theory and trying to uh, come up with a mathematically generalizable way of creating categories, which are quite arbitrary, and then studying their impact upon um, whether somebody gets hired or fired, right? Or hired or rejected. And they show that actually the way we're categorizing also affects uh, whether somebody is going to get hired or not hired by the algorithm. So it's not just as simple as getting a completely unbiased, whatever that means, data set. It's also the, the construction of the algorithm which needs to change. Yeah, definitely. That's uh, yeah, it's super interesting. I think that also shows wherever you start, there will be biases, even yeah. if you categorize, that's still depends on biased. exactly that's still biased uh wow yeah i guess just being curious around the data is very important uh, yeah way. totally yeah no thank you for that um we have two questions in the chat box uh so the first one was you mentioned that people can decolonize their minds like an individual effort and go bottom up what sorts of top-down methods do you think are required to decolonize science so do you mean so if if I say from decolonizing community practices, if we're talking about creating inclusive community, uh, what I somewhat touched upon um, is hiring practices, who we allow in to, into the field. And something that has uh, been brought about through diversity efforts, and actually this is something that I hear a lot against um, affirmative action, is that somebody who is meritorious, regardless of their uh, whichever character, social characteristics, will be allowed in through the door. But this sort of thinking com completely excludes a very large group of people, especially if you start to think that meritocracy is an imagined concept. Um, it starts to neglect social histories, economic histories of people. And also it puts forward a very specific line and way of thought, which ultimately is quite colonial. So I would argue for broader hiring criteria. And at the start of it, to start with, a hiring criteria that reflects um, community mindedness and inclusion at its very heart. So don't hire people who've got the most publications or the best grades in school or the most work experience necessarily the best, whatever you consider to be the best companies. Think a little bit about why these companies, why you perceive these companies or these universities to be the best and understand ultimately that they are the best because of quite violent sociopolitical histories and, and forces that have allowed them to be on top in the same in that way. Another community practice I think that we could decolonize is the way we present scientific findings. I think very good papers that I have read and very good scientific journal articles that I've read are very, are, their language is not as, I should say, as dominant. So the language is quite humble. It, it acknowledges the discrepancies in their study. It acknowledges the assumptions that they have made. And to me, that is really good science. But interestingly, these articles end up being cited far less. 
we we should also think about um, what kind of studies are actually bringing getting into the constant the idea of citation. Citations by country, I mean, the statistics are wild. Like uh, citations from North America and Europe far outstrip citations in, from universities and research institutions in any other part of the world. And there's obviously a reason for that. There are reasons about how we view science done in various countries and by various people. And that's something that a community, as a community, we can make more of an effort. In, if you're an academic, cite, cite um, papers that are not written in what, again, you perceive to be the top European universities. Cite papers that are written elsewhere. Think about issues of funding and issues of access that there might be. If you are a commercial organization that is implementing studies, try to implement studies that are done in communities outside of your immediate vicinity. Think about where, think about a participatory research framework. Think about where the study that you're trying to implement would be the most grounded in community values. So there's quite a lot that, that can be said about community practices. Wow, thank you. Uh, yeah, it's a lot of things. Uh, this is very eye-opening. Uh, uh, yeah, for citations, I would take it for granted, oh, it was cited by X university. Uh, for sure, this is credible. No. But exactly, other universities might not have access to funding. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean their research is not up to par with any other research. Uh, thank you. Uh, we have two more questions. Uh, so thanks for the presentation. Talking about uh, openness and honesty in science, is there any independent unbiased scientific researches uh, on the divinity and spiritual world, talking of theories like the creation theory, the soul of man, and so forth? Honestly, I don't know. Um, but just in terms of a language check, I don't think anyone can be unbiased. And I think that the most unbiased you can be is by acknowledging your bias and positionality. But I don't know anything about the divinity um, side of things. And that's probably something that I should really look up, but I haven't done. Perfect, thank you. Um, the next question would be a uh, great presentation. Thank you. Don't you think that even if we try to unbiased data sets, there's still an issue to define metrics? Uh, I think about fairness, for example, individual fairness versus group fairness. I think that goes back to what we were talking about earlier. Absolutely. And as I said, there is a lot to be said about the about the pipeline. It's not just creating an unbiased data set, like creating community-based labeling and purposeful labeling. And we also need to think about, um, as you say, metrics uh, of, of judging a model and that's in the testing phase. Absolutely. We also need to think about the pre-processing phase. What are the what do we do to pre-process data to make it uh, usable for machine learning models. And sometimes the pre-processing um, methods can be quite un inhuman in the sense that, I don't mean this as a cruelty thing, I just mean this in the sense that we can choose to neglect bits of data, we can choose to average out a particular set of data and, and impute those missing values in a data column. And they don't have any understanding of why a particular value of data could be the way it is when put it in a put in a social context. And this is an extremely tall ask for an individual data scientist to do. But I think more, more work and more attention has to be put on this part, on the data pre-processing part, and also as you say, in the testing part. So I completely agree with you. Great, thank you. Yeah, I guess even with the data pre-processing is to also have more than one data scientist looking at it rather than one point of view, uh, just yeah. to diversify the different points of view. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, perfect. So if we rightly throw away uh, markers of merit with a violent history, what do we replace them with to filter good from bad science? Honest science. Filter it, fil filter things based on, don't allow uh, scientific claims to be not just unfounded, but I, I personally have trouble uh, accepting scientific claims that don't have a large limitation section because that makes me suspicious because I know that most of every, every model, no matter how good, no matter how general, as we like to say in my field, will have significant limitations and assumptions in it. So for me, good science would be honest science good science would be something that is inclusive, that has brought together people in the community towards trying to understand something within the constraints that we have um, in front of us. So that's what I would call good science. 
Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Um, and in terms of if someone doesn't really read a lot of like scientific papers, what would you, how would you advise them uh, to basically know how, kind of differentiate uh, what research paper is less biased than the other research paper? I mean, just look at the language, like um, the way, the way that some things are written could be just for example, we have found that such and such is, is shown is better, is, is worse, I think, than saying, we have found that under these circumstances and with these uh, model assumptions, this has, this behavior has been exhibited or this has been seen. Do you know what I mean? There's like a difference in the way things are worded. And then if you, at the end of the paper, if you sit down and you think that you cannot think of a single situation without having to do significant work on your part in wh where this particular claim would fail, I think that paper has not been written well. Okay, perfect. No, that's yeah. Thank you for these tips. Uh, yeah, coming from a non scientific background, that's definitely very useful. Uh, we have one more question. In healthcare, there's a trend towards more personalized care based on the patient characteristics, uh, precision medicine, digital twins, etc. Do you think this could help uh, to fix the problems from cohort based findings that can suffer from biases, as you highlighted? Um, so, in terms of personalized healthcare, um, if you mean that this that a particular model or a particular healthcare plan would be uh, designed based on a single individual, then yeah, I think that's a really, that seems like a good idea. But instead, if you think, if this model is, is being created based on some sort of industry average and then slightly tweaked for individuals or being generalized across cultures and continents and so on, I think that's exactly a diagnostic of the problem that we have. And by the way, the healthcare industry and the data that is being mined in healthcare suffers from quite a large racialization problem as far as I'm aware, because of, again, biased data sets and biased um, industry standards within the healthcare and medical professional that are quite racially biased as it stands. Yeah, yeah, I've been reading a lot of articles actually, especially about, um, even if you take the average, but especially specifically on like female medicine as well, Mm -hmm. um which yeah definitely shows the point of you can't take no yeah absolutely racially. and certain and certain diseases are racialized as well when whereas if you think about it it's just a matter of where the disease was detected and why and and what the climate was etc and that's and it's not a racial disease it's a disease of people it's not a racial characteristic right yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. Exactly. As you said it. Uh, well, this has been super interesting. Thank you so much for this. Uh, we welcome. have five minutes if anyone has any questions. Um, and if that's okay with you, if we'll share your LinkedIn details. Absolutely. Uh, would you like me like to stop sharing my screen? Uh, no, it's okay. Um, Bruni would share it uh, in the chat box. Uh, so if anyone would like to reach out. Thank you so much for this. This was a very interesting, thought-provoking session. Um, there it is in the chat box if anyone uh, would like to connect with you and has further questions. Um, and perfect. Thank you everyone for joining. Uh, we'll stick around for five minutes uh, in case anyone has any other questions. And uh, please don't forget to subscribe to our newsletter for any upcoming uh, events with All in Tech. And thank you for joining us. This was an extremely interesting session.